I have to remind you, this is Bangkok. When you talk about election, this is Bangkok, not Bangkok election, okay? I think people got really excited. We are talking about Myanmar election on the 8th of November and the implication. To make sure that we are in Thailand, I would like to invite uh, the deans of the political uh, science faculty, Chula Rongkorn University, Professor Ek Tang Suwatana, and then the, he will give you a short opening remark, and then we'll follow by the second uh, editor at large from the Nikkei Asian Review, Mr. Ken uh, Koyanangi. Wow, just to remind you, it's the same Nikkei that bought uh, Financial Times, okay? Please, Dr. A. Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I have uh, the pleasure of uh, opening today's ISIS uh, public forum, uh, Myanmar uh, 2050 election and beyond previews, prospects, and post election scenarios. Myanmar is preparing for its first free election in uh, 25 years. On November 8th, much attention will be focused on Aung San, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, leader of uh, the Oppositional National League for Democracy. Despite her popularity, so much in this election is not yet clear. She cannot become president. The constitution bans her. Who will run as the NLD's candidate for president? The ruling USDP party is likely to face heavy losses at the polls, but could they retain enough to prevent an NLD majority? And what effect will ethnic parties have on the election outcome? How will they align? Above all, how will issues such as the ongoing uh, peace process? Now in its final stage, under this government and simmering secretary tension play out in the transitional phase. While much is up in the air, many things in Myanmar will stay the same regarding the military draft constitution. For now, though, Myanmar's gradual embrace of democracy should be routed. The recent progress made under the Tianjin administration would have been unimaginable just a few years ago. However, a great deal more work is required to ensure the consolidation of Myanmar's democratic gains. I would like to express my appreciation to the sponsor of this event uh, first, the Nikkei uh, Asian Review. Uh, this is the fourth ISIS conference it has sponsored, and I sincerely thank uh, Ken Konayaki and everyone at the Nikkei for their ongoing support. And also many thanks to Halish Bo Stiftung, uh, without whom we could not have brought together such an outstanding uh, panel. And also many thanks. Uh, Sorry. Uh, joining us are uh, Dr. Richard Horsey and Dr. Liu, Liu Yin Lai, who have flown from Myanmar. Uh, joining us, so, and Dr. Tin Mong Mong Tan has come from Singapore, and also a grand uh, lobbyist, uh, as a senior fellow here at ISIS, as a chief editor of the NAR. Uh, without further ado, let me turn the floor to uh, PKV uh, for uh, con uh, convening this uh, seminar conference. Thank you. Excellence is distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. And um, Dr. Aka, thank you for war warm words. Um, my name is Ken Koyanagi, uh, editor at large of Nikkei Asian Review. Uh, we are especially delighted to be a part of this uh, event because. Nikkei Asian Review and Nikkei 
has a special attachment to Myanmar. Nikkei Asian Review launched on November 21st in 2013. And that month uh, coincided with the month we opened our Yangon Bureau. And Nikkei Asian Review opening launch issue was on Myanmar. And the title was Hangon Yangon. So we have a very special memory about uh, Myanmar. And actually, Gwen Robinson sitting over there used to cover Myanmar for FT, and they moved to Nikkei Asian Review. So we have, uh, so far, an advantage over FT <laughs> about the coverage of Myanmar. But now we have uh, acquired FT, so it's going to be a comp it's not going to be a competition, but probably about uh, cooperation, we hope. Anyway, even forgetting about our attachment, uh, personal attachment to Myanmar, we are very, very interested in what's going to happen at election and after election, because so many things are at stake. We are wondering if there is, will be a successful, peaceful transition of power from the military authoritarian regime to civilian democratic regime. That's a very big issue. And also we are <clears throat> especially interested in whether they will be successfully achieve election as a kind of a tool for consensus rather than um, um, opportunity for divide. Because a lot of elections result in divide rather than harmony. So we are especially uh, focusing on that point. And second, will Myanmar achieve economic development under free, free society, free democratic society, rather than authoritarian controlled society? That's another issue at stake, we believe. Um, this is especially important because a lot of uh, uh, Asian political leaders claim that there is an Asian model of a mixture of uh, authoritarian and democratic uh, political systems. But as a member of the press, we, we strongly believe in freedom of speech and freedom of expression. So we are wondering if Myanmar will be successful in um, having both freedom and the governability at the same time. And also, also um, um, we are interested in if they will successfully achieve a federal state of a multi-ethnic society, because it's a very big challenge. There are very few countries who have been successful in achieving that. And even if you limit to the federal political system, there are very few successful countries in the world, like the United States, Germany, um, that's about it, probably. Well, Indonesia, India, probably uh, in, will be included in that. But uh, there is a big challenge for Myanmar to achieve that uh, peaceful federal union. And that would be a uh, biggest challenge after the election. And, and of course, as a member of the press, we are interested in what's going to happen to uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, the world, probably the strongest focus will be on her uh, future after the election. And we are looking forward to today's discussion, and we are looking forward to covering what's going to happen before, during, and after the election in Myanmar. Thank you. I, again, would like to, to thank the sponsors, uh, Nikkei uh, Asian Reviews, Hendrik uh, Bo Stiftung, and also uh, all the uh, staffers of ISIS to organize this within very short times because of the hot issue here. If you look at the title, you will see that it's a very, very uh, holistic, you know. After you attend this meeting, you will understand that what uh, would be the futures. Uh, Myanmar 2015 elections and beyond, previews, prospect, post-election scenario. This is exactly what we try to give you. That is why we have assembled uh, actually five speakers, but one of the speakers uh, Han Yao Wei uh, could not come because he have to attend the ongoing uh, peace talk in the, inside Myanmar. So we have three speakers. I need no introductions. Uh, we will give them as much as time they want to speak, articulate the issue, 
until I stop them. Um, the first speaker will be uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Hosey. I mean, uh, he will give you the uh, overview, of the key issues, and then will be followed by uh, our good friends, Dr. Tin Mong Mong Tan. He's uh, all hands. Uh, he has been the all hands and also very senior in the sense that he has been the commenting situation in in Myanmar. He will give you some of the. Uh, uh, important points and from the strong economic perspective. And our third uh, speaker, Joe Lai, you know him well. He uh, have many hats. Uh, I lost count, but he know what's going on inside. And then we will have a discussion. Gwen Robinson, uh, you have to be nice to her this day because the, she, her power spread all over not only Southeast Asia, but Europe as well. So without further ado, with one observation, whatever the outcome of the elections, uh, November 8, it will be a game changer, not only in Burma, but inside ASEAN, because this election means so much for the region. And by the way, whoever be the president will be the oldest in ASEAN's contact. That is very interesting, because we are familiar, you know. So the average age of the new leaders who know will be 69. You have uh, President Wu Ting saying his 70s, and uh, two last five months. Uh, wow, well, is there another candidate? Is 78? No, 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 no. Six, I thought 69. 69. Sorry, 69. So you have this uh, 69 uh, bracket. Yeah. So in Thailand, wow. Well, you need another coup. Uh, um, okay, please. Um, okay, please, uh, Dr. Uh, Hosey. I'd like to thank the organizers very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, when we look at the significance of the upcoming elections in Myanmar, I think it's very important to remember that Myanmar is in, a, in the midst of a transition. These are elections in the middle of a transition, uh, maybe even in the early stages of a transition. And so they're very different from elections in a, in a mature democracy. Um, and I think it's therefore very important to look at the elections in the context of present day Myanmar and in the context uh, of the uh, transition that it's undergoing. And that transition is one of fairly deep historical divisions. Uh, along multiple dimensions. So there are divisions between center and periphery, between ethnic minorities and the ethnic majority, uh, between rich and poor, between the old elite and the democratic, uh, democratic forces. Uh, and these divisions uh, you know, have been baked in to the political context of Myanmar over many decades. And so the question for the elections really is not only will they be technically sound, but how will they contribute uh, to easing those divisions and, and uniting the country? And so that's the perspective that I'd like to start, uh, start um, uh, looking at. Um, because really, you know, the key measure uh, of the success uh, of this transition uh, is not just about electoral democracy, it's about whether it can ultimately bring the country together and unify it. Um, so if we look at the current situation uh, in terms of those divisions, we have to say that it's not a particularly bright picture in, in many respects. Um, the peace process is poised at a really critical juncture right now, with the parties coming together uh, tomorrow in what is really the last ditch effort before the elections uh, to agree a nationwide ceasefire. Uh, so the elections, in a sense, have imposed an artificial deadline on those talks. Um, it remains very unclear whether a deal can be done. Um, uh, you know, we'll find out in a few days. But really, you know, when you think about bringing together more than 20 different armed groups around a single table and trying to thrash out a peace deal, in the context of an ongoing political transition. It's an incredibly fraught, uh, it's an incredibly fraught task. Uh, and 
imposing uh, the uh, the divisions of, a, of, a, of, a, of an electoral uh, process in the middle of that uh, can only uh, make things more difficult. You know, the success of the peace process is predicated on finding new ways to res resolve uh, differences, uh, to build consensus and unity. And, you know, electoral democracy is all about competition for power. And so, um, you know, clearly the, the, the elections coming uh, in a couple of months' time uh, have not made it easier for those around the peace table to, uh, to, to reach uh, these historic agreements. If we look at the old elite, we see deep divisions there, and these have come out into the fore, into the public domain, uh, even more obviously, I think, in the last, in the last few weeks. So, you know, the, the ruling USDP party itself is deeply divided into different factions. Uh, there are tensions between the military and the USDP factions. Um, and in fact, those, those divisions exist on the opposition side as well. Um, you know, the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi are the, uh, are, are the vanguard of the democratic forces, but there are many different uh, pro-democracy forces in society, uh, and they're not all uh, united. Um, you know, we can see the 88 generation students, who are the, probably the other uh, big uh, political force, uh, um, political pro-democracy force, uh, and there have been historically some differences of opinion between the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi on the one side and the students on the other. You know, I think in the last couple of years what we've seen is that some of those divisions have been eased. Uh, there seem to be a political uh, coming together of the two, of the two groups. Um, they jointly campaigned for a constitutional change, uh, including a change that would allow Aung San Suu Kyi to be president. Um, but very recently, when the NLD released uh, its list of candidates for the election, uh, more than a dozen senior leaders of the 88 generation were not included in that list, uh, to the surprise of many people, I think, in, including those leaders themselves. Uh, so this raises questions you know, about divisions also on the pro-democracy side. And then we have uh, you know, the resurgence of Buddhist nationalism another division in the country, religious division. And this has been very prominent, uh, and, it, and these voices of Buddhist nationalism are, I think, getting louder uh, as we get closer to the elections. Um, you know, this Buddhist nationalist uh, surge has not been primarily around elections, but I think it has been around the division of societal, of power within society. You know, if you think about a country that was, uh, you know, under dictatorship, very little uh, freedom, traditionally there were sort of two powers in the country. There was the military and there was the Sangha. Uh, and the Sangha enjoyed, uh, you know, uh, a very powerful uh, position. It was courted by the military. Uh, but also, you know, if you go into the rural areas of Myanmar, it is the local monk who really wields the moral influence who wields uh, some uh, uh, some legal uh, you know um, legal powers as well, uh, and I think the Sangha felt that at a moment when the country was opening up, they saw the threat of modernity and secularism. Looking around the region, looking around the world, you know, Myanmar is a very traditional society, and so I think there's been great fear that as the country opens up to the world. Um, as, as debate launches, as economic growth comes, what does this mean for the traditional values of the society and the guardians of those traditional uh, values, the Sangha? And so I think you know, there's been a lot of unease and questions about what will be the role of the Sangha going forward. And I think this has led uh, to you know, the narrative of Buddhism under threat and to this, uh, to this nationalist sentiment. So we see all these, these divisions. and. Um, what we also see in relation to the elections are some very high expectations. So the three main sort of power blocks in the elections, the USDP, the NLD, and the ethnic minority parties. So the USDP uh, has high expectations. Uh, it's saying, at least, its leaders are saying that it's going to do reasonably well. It thinks that there's not going to be a rout. Um, the NLD it feels that it should and possibly could uh, regain the massive landslide that it achieved in the abortive 1990 elections. 
uh, and the ethnic parties are aiming to get 25% of the seats in Parliament. So those are the sort of stated aims of those three blocks. And I think while it's very unclear how these elections are going to play out, uh, what is quite clear is that none of those expectations are likely to be met. So, you know, how well will the USDP do? Uh, opinion is divided on the matter. The USDP leadership feels they'll do quite well. Almost everybody else, I think, feels that they'll do quite badly. Uh, exactly how badly is the, is the subject of much discussion um, and speculation. Uh, but it's clear they're going to uh, shrink in size significantly from the 80% uh, of seats that they currently control, 80% of elected seats that they currently control. Uh, the NLD uh, will find it very difficult, I think, in this new political environment to repeat its 1990 success. I think it's fairly clear that the NLD will become the largest single party in the parliament, but whether or not it will have an outright majority is uh, very much an open question and is a very high bar for the party to achieve, I think. Uh, particularly when you have you know, a resurgence of ethnic politics and hopefully the ability for the elections to take place in many more parts of the borderlands than previous elections could. And then the ethnic parties, uh, they're aiming for 25%, uh, but I think this is going to be extremely difficult uh, to achieve. Uh, in the 1990 elections and in the 2010 elections, they achieved about the same result, about 15% uh, of the seats. Um, in the, in the 2010 uh, electoral case, uh, that's actually better than it sounds because 25% of those seats are reserved for the military. Um, but it still means that they would have to uh, do significantly better, maybe even double their electoral success of the past. Uh, and there are a number of challenges uh, to them being able to do that. Um, you know, Although they won far less seats in 2010 than I think uh, they probably would have done if those elections were free and fair, um, the, landscape, the political landscape has changed for those parties. Since 2010, many more ethnic parties uh, have uh, have uh, registered to compete. And in fact, of the 89 uh, parties registered for these elections, two-thirds of them are representing ethnic minorities. So there's a large number of ethnic parties, and that raises the prospect of vote splitting. And the, you know, the, the beneficiaries of vote splitting are likely to be the large national parties, particularly the NLD. So I think it's going to be very hard um, for those ethnic minority parties to, uh, to achieve their aim. Um, and you know, across the board in Myanmar, there's been uh, very little in the way of alliance or coalition building. Uh, and so you know, the, the hope of the ethnic parties was that they could build alliances and that those alliances uh, could um, uh, avoid uh, competing against each other in particular constituencies. But they could thrash out no-compete agreements. Uh, but none of the three ethnic party alliances have actually been able to come up with any uh, detailed workable uh, agreement along those lines. So at the moment, it looks as if uh, you know, they will be going head to head, not only against uh, the NLD and the USDP, uh, but against each other in, in, in many seats as well. Now, the polls themselves uh, are shaping up to be fairly credible and inclusive. Uh, so electoral administration is much, much better than it was in 2010 or indeed in the 2012 uh, by-election. There's been a, a concerted effort to, uh, um, to digitize and clean up the voter roll. You may have heard very many bad things in the media about the uh, voter roll. Uh, it is a mess. But uh, it's pretty much to be expected that when you uh, type in for the first time uh, everyone, you know, 30 million names across the country, uh, that you're going to get some errors. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the documents on which they were based, the, the immigration and the household lists at the, at the village level, they're a mess too. So it's hardly any surprise that, that the initial iteration of the voter roll uh, is a mess. But, you know, concerted efforts are being made to digitize this, make it a single national list remove duplicate names, remove dead people, all those sort of things. Um, there's also been uh, a lot of efforts to change the way in which advance votes uh, are administered. In 2010, the big story about how those polls were swung in favor of the USDP was advance voting. You know, and sacks of advance votes would arrive from somewhere or other after the polls had closed and would magically change the result uh, from one candidate to another. Um, 
this time around, the Election Commission has put in place some pretty rigorous procedures that will hopefully prevent that sort of thing from happening. Uh, advanced votes can be observed. They have to be counted before polls close. They have to be counted in front of observers uh, and, and so on. And for the first time in a Myanmar election, international observers, including long-term observers, are being invited, uh, as well as local electoral observers. Um, and they're being invited on, on pretty good international uh, best practice uh, terms. Um, and lastly, the finances of elections have been eased significantly. In 2010, it cost about $500 uh, for a candidate to register, and that was a non-returnable fee. Uh, even if you won, you didn't get your money back. So that made it, you know, when you think there's over a thousand constituencies in the country, that made it really very expensive for large parties to run and uh, very, very expensive for candidates uh, to put themselves forward. Uh, that's been reduced. It's about $250 now, uh, and it's a deposit. Uh, anyone who wins their seat or who gets more than 12.5% uh, of the vote get that back. Uh, so that's a significant uh, easing of the accessibility of, of, of standing. Um, so, you know, the polls are looking like they will be fairly credible and inclusive, as I said, but there are nevertheless uh, uh, big challenges and there will be significant, significant caveats uh, to, to that general picture, I think. Um, the first is the security context, particularly if no uh, nationwide ceasefire is agreed uh, in the coming days, uh, and maybe even if it is, there will be significant parts of the periphery where no elections will take place for security reasons. Uh, and there's also a risk of violence and intimidation in other areas where the elections do, do go ahead. And there have already been some incidents uh, along those lines. Um, there's also a significant lack of capacity in the election commission at the local level. Uh, the, you know, these are a group of officials who don't have a huge amount of experience uh, uh, in the mechanics of elections or in the sort of principles of electoral democracy. And then I think Rakhine State also uh, stands out as a place where there can be significant uh, issues. Uh, you know, the, uh, more than a million members of the Muslim community, including Rohingya, were, were disenfranchised. And it remains to be seen what the impact of that might be on, on the security and stability. But it will certainly have an impact on, on views of the inclusiveness uh, of the polls. So that's, that's the elections. But the really big questions are, you know, what comes after the elections? These are not presidential elections, these are general elections. They elect members of the legislature. And then it's the members of the legislature who come together to choose the president. So on the day after the, the uh, November elections, uh, the future will not be that clear. Um, because it's very uncertain, actually, who can be president. The leader of what will likely be the largest party, Dorong San Suu Kyi, is constitutionally barred from the presidency, and that is not going to change. Um, there are not many other obvious candidates. Within the NLD, it's very unclear if there could be another candidate who has the experience, uh, the seniority, uh, you know, to be president. Um, and outside of the NLD, um, it's also quite unclear who a presidential candidate that Aung San Suu Kyi would back could be. Uh, the Speaker of the Lower House, the Rishwe Man, is much talked about. He's said that he wants it. Uh, in fact, he said that if there was a position higher than president, he'd want that one too. Um, and he's very close to Aung San Suu Kyi. He has her trust. Uh, they have a good working relationship. But he's the leader of the USDP. And it's very hard politically to imagine the head of a party, you know, the head of a party who leads that party into what will probably be an electoral defeat, then rising Phoenix-like from the ashes and becoming president, especially if Aung San Suu Kyi sticks with her principle that any uh, candidate for the presidency backed by the NLD must be an NLD member. If that's the case, he'd have to rise Phoenix-like from the ashes, cross the floor, join the NLD, and then become president. Uh, not impossible, uh, maybe even the most likely scenario, but it does stretch uh, credulity, I think. Um, who else is there? Um, the current president uh, has indicated that he would be willing to run if asked. But then the question is, will he be asked? And that's not so clear. Uh, relations with Aung San Suu Kyi are tense. Uh, she has said in the past that you know she's not well disposed uh, towards him. Uh, that could change, but uh, at the present moment, it doesn't look very bright. 
And beyond those two, beyond the current president and the current speaker, um, we're into the realm of dark horse candidates. And then there are many, many possibilities, none of which are particularly uh, obvious. So huge uncertainty then about what the what the political leadership of Myanmar will look like uh, you know, at the end of this uh, electoral transition period. It's quite a long period, so there's lots of time for people to think about the implications for this, for the winners and the losers to calculate their odds. Uh, because after the elections in November, uh, the presidential election is unlikely to be held until early February. Uh, there'll be a month for the presidential candidate to form their cabinet and a transfer of power and late March, most likely. So a very long period uh, of uncertainty. So we don't know who will be president. And the president is the person who selects the cabinet. And so we don't really know what the, what the cabinet will look like either. Um, we don't know what the peace process will look like. The peace process, if it doesn't succeed in, in the coming days, will uh, go into a hiatus of 9 to 12 months, I would guess. Um, and it's very uncertain how it will emerge from that period and what the policies of the new government will be and what the realities on the ground will be. And I think a very big question uh, will be relations between the military and whatever new president and administration takes over. The military has been close to Thane Sein. They've backed Thane Sein. There have been few serious tensions between them. Uh, but the military is not so well disposed to Thura Shweiman. They're suspicious of Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, and so an Aung San Suu Kyi backed Shweiman presidency would be unlikely to have the same level of trust and close cooperation with the military. And that raises questions about the ability of such an administration to, to, to govern. Um, and then I think there's going to be a huge expectations gap. Um, you know, the population of Myanmar has many needs, many expectations. Uh, some of those have started to be met through the political transition, much greater freedom of speech, much greater uh, you know, ability to, to, um, to uh, well, economic growth uh, and other things. But what, what really hasn't changed is, you know, for the large majority of the population, particularly in rural areas, uh, they haven't seen a huge change in their, in their standard of living. Um, and so there's going to be huge expectations, I think, on any new administration. And it's going to be incredibly difficult for any government to, to meet those expectations. Um, so I think, you know, if we look to the future, we see a huge amount of uncertainty. But what we can say is that, you know, Myanmar will find a way to muddle through. It, it usually does. Uh, it's not going to be either dramatically brilliant or catastrophically bad. The reforms will generally continue. Uh, the current reform program has buy-in from all of the political elites, the military, uh, the USDP, uh, the NLD, the, the country as a whole. And so I think, in general, that that transition process will continue. The broad arc of the of the transition will continue to be the same. Uh, but with lots of potentially important uh, changes at the, at the micro level. There will continue to be greater international in, uh, engagement uh, and investment. And, you know, the macroeconomic picture for Myanmar looks reasonably bright. I think, uh, you know, 7-8% uh, GDP growth year on year for the next uh, foreseeable, for the foreseeable future is, is certainly uh, possible. But, you know, the, mi the micro picture will be much less rosy. I think inequality is already reasonably high on a par with other countries uh, in the region and will probably be set to, 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 to rise. And so you'll see uh, all, of the, all of the tensions in society that, that come from that, uh, from that sort of inequality. Uh, landlessness, land loss, land grabbing, um, uh, and so on. Uh, so I think, you know, broad, broad, uh, broad summing up, um, reasonably credible elections, hugely uncertain aftermath. Myanmar generally con continuing on its trajectory, but with the deep uh, problems of the country still being extremely difficult for, for any government to resolve. Thanks. I, I was very surprised your sense, you know, you give us despair, and then you give us hope, and then despair, and then more hope, and then more despair. I think that is the uh, takeaway I got. But uh, he has raised so many, many questions about futures of Myanmar. But Myanmar will stay, uh, I think, after the election as a key player in the region, the uh, uh, game changer. Now, our 
second speaker, Dr. Tin Momo Tan Yu, will probably uh, have a lot to say about uh, economic uh, perspective. Thank you. I wish I'm the last speaker, anyway. Um, actually, uh, Gwen wants me to talk about um, more on the politics as well, so probably I will just sit on the fence of sort of thing between politics and economics and probably get blasted for both. I thought uh, we could make it political economy. <laughs> well, first I want to say something about uh, the elections. I don't believe in uh, crystal ball gazing because I'm an academic. Um, and I think I concur with Richard about this muddling through theory, which I have also said that at China News Asia last month. OK, one can ask, what are elections for? If elections are simply to elect a majority uh, winner and let them then form a government and everything's OK, it'll be that simple. We won't have this forum. But that is the simplistic kind of notion that many Myanmar on the ground had, at least had. I don't know whether they have now. And in the history of Myanmar's elections, did the outcome really change the game, or did the outcome really benefit the people? That is questionable. In the 50s, the first election was during civil war, and a major chunk of the opposition, the national, uh, what you call, um, the old, old first version of NDF, National Democratic Front, stayed out, boycotted. The communists were, went underground, and the civil war raged on. And after a few years, the 40-year reign, supposed reign of AFPFL, the ruling party, fell apart. The 1960 election saw a landslide victory by UNU's party, irrespective of the candidates. It sounded a bit like NLD at those days. They voted for the UNU's party, whoever the candidate is. But it didn't last long. Two years later, the military coup. And there were a lot of instabilities after that, split between the ruling party and so on. The 1970s and 80s, we saw many, many elections, four years for a one-party state. So I just lumped them together as one election. And that also resulted in the bankruptcy of the state. In the 1990 elections, I don't know what you call it, the aftermath, because there's a lot of debate on whether the promise is true or the promise is false or people went back on their promises. But the fact is that the perception of the people was that this simple notion of energy winning and forming a government it didn't happen, <clears throat> despite all the facts which says that the military did not intend or even told that they would be handed over except for Usama himself. So the 2010 elections, again, maybe some say it's a half election because NLD was not there. <laughs> and what happened afterwards? Well, what happened afterwards is probably the law of unintended consequences, I would say, because we have this reform government coming up. Unintended in the original aim of the seven step roadmap, I suspect. So, what do we have for the 2015? I don't think we should expect too much. I think the world expects too much. It will not bring in liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is a very long way in Myanmar. Whether they even want it, the elites want it, is questionable. Even Aung San Suu Kyi is questionable in a sense, if you use the theoretical premises of a liberal democracy because the society itself is involved. So basically, it will be a very much disappointment for many people, I would say, even if NLD wins in that sense. So the great question is whether after the election, there would be, will Myanmar become more governable or less governable? Governability is the issue to me, rather than who wins and who runs, because as you say, if there are various factions and power factions within the country which are dissatisfied with the results, and they can block. Many of them can block the, 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 the development. Uh, they cannot execute because they are not running the show. But the guys or girls running the show would have a hard time. That is the difference. And it is very different from 2010 where the fatherly figure put everything in place afterwards when the government is formed. Now, there has to be a lot of horse trading. Myanmar has a very awfully long period of intermission between the elections and the government. And that is good or bad? I don't know. Good for horse trading, perhaps. And we are not used to horse trading because we don't have horses. We have bullocks and cattle. Uh, so.
that's about the elections and the ethnic groups, the politics, the peace process. There's, there are legacy issues which will carry on after the elections, even if the peace agreement is signed and national wide peace agreement is signed before the elections. It continue more and more because of the issues of federalism, security sector reform, DDR, development, and then resource allocation, and so on and so forth. And changing the constitution will come back. It is not going, it's not going to go away. As for the economics, the problem with Myanmar is also that um, in the rest of the world, we can't find any models. People tend to look for models. The Chinese say, don't follow our model. The Singaporean model is impossible to replicate anywhere in the world, I would say. So Myanmar has experimented in the past in its political economy, coming from the old colonial resource extraction. It sounds familiar. We're still extracting resources. Resource extraction, mercantilist economy, supposed to be exploitation by the, the earliest MNCs like the Bombay Burma Company. Globalization was there already in that sense. Uh, we come back full circle to welcoming MNCs. And then we experiment with socialism, where everybody is poor, including the state. And then we have full-fledged on market so-called economy, which is a euphemism for capitalism. And then we have a problem of legacies of the past, which is the notions and uh, lingering notions about equality and socialism. It's still there in the people, in the NLD party itself, in part of the uh, NUP party, part of the even USDP people, equality, and then this huge issue about minimum wage which is raging on, whether you want to have the capitalists to ruin so that nobody will have a job, that is one extreme, or that you want to make raise the uh, livelihood of the workers at the expense of the employer, and then the, he will go bust and nobody gets a job. That is one extreme scenario painted by the mostly the employer side. And then, of course, the equality, uh, cost of living. Because Myanmar has opened up, it become more internationalized. We are talking about international prices and costs in many things, whereas our local productivity is low, and where, when our uh, wages are very low. So this is an issue which is uh, like a catch-22. If you have a Minimum wage, it has to be revised repeatedly over the next decades, as in elsewhere. Would it be uh, linked to inflation or whatever? It will never be, It's unless Myanmar reach a productivity level and uh, uh, middle income or whatever it is defined. Uh, it will be very difficult to catch up with prices. And there's a general popular notion that whenever the wages are raised, price will go up. It's like a, a given. And, and it is a self-fulfilling prophecy, too. And there are issues about foreign direct investment, right? Myanmar's political economy is predicated on two things, trade and investment. That is the standard neoliberal uh, economic uh, regime, which has no other choice. We don't have socialism anymore. Well, we do have a developmental state concept in the 70s, but that is becoming fading because the developmental states are also having problems. Korea and Japan, to show, except maybe Singapore. So we are left with the so-called market in a country where there are so much distorted markets and so much information gaps. If Stiglitz is going to run the show, of course he will talk about information, but that's not all the, all the story. We have so many advisors and visitors from a whole spectrum of neoliberal economists uh, to uh, those who are angling for free markets, total free trade, and those who are angling for some protectionism. And then we have hundreds of people marching in and out of Nepiro and Yango with different ideas which are contradictory into a population which is receptive to new ideas and we become so confused. I'm not sure whether the presidential advisor are as confused as I am. I hope not. And then we have this high expectations. I think it is out of goodwill when the, this government came to power say that we are going to reduce poverty. That is the best thing every, any best kind of phrase any government can do. But the curse of the incumbents is on them. Reducing poverty is one of the most difficult job in the world, I would say. And there are many unsuccessful uh, elements. Throwing money is not the answer. 
Raising education takes a long time. And then you are cooked to the market economy. If you are a commodity producer, you are at the mercy of the so-called market, which sometimes will kill off a whole section of people when prices plummeted. And we are not used to that. Our people are not psychologically prepared for bus, for bankruptcy in that sense. And that is one of the issues. Our SMEs are in a mess. And SMEs fail all the time. Even in advanced countries, something like 90% of the first year SME fails, but they have to come back. In my case, we have now a dedicated SME bank, small and medium enterprises, with a capital which is minuscule, I'm sorry to say. And what do you do about poverty? We don't even agree on what is the poverty line. We can't. It is very difficult conceptually. We don't even agree whether the 26% that was announced by the president was true or not. There have been revisions saying it's upward of 30 plus. It doesn't matter. He said it will be down by 16%. I think it is, as a politician, I would not say that the use figures. I would say I will reduce poverty as much as I can, which is the easy way out. If you have figures and targets, that's very, very difficult. And unfortunately, uh, the same for Myanmar. And the, the thing is that you can't borrow money from China and throw it at the, at the, at the rural area to relieve poverty. That's, that's good for one year, two year. But in the final uh, analysis, somehow it has to be sustained. So poverty reduction is not just throwing money, creating jobs. Yes, theoretically you say you have 1,000 workers and 1,000 factories, then you would have one, 1 million employed. That somebody said that. I don't want to name names. How do you do that? What happened to special economic zones? The problem with special is the special thing. If you have a special, what are the non-specials? The rest of the country. And enclaves are created, and, and the politics of envy comes in. The workers in the zone are better off, and those are not and so on and so forth. So there are no good answers, and these will remain after the elections. At the moment, the tackling of these issues probably are, t are a bit of uh, becoming a kind of uh, lackluster because of this election fervor. And some of them can't wait very much. And people's vote, how do people vote? Are they vote on a transaction basis, or emotional basis, on prejudices? A simple thing that when he went to a polling station, he was angry with his wife could change the whole thing. Or angry with the guard, the guard that, that passed by and splashed him. And that means the capitalists, the cronies, and so on. People don't go to the station and talk about logic and games. They just vote like that. So we never know. So this is the known unknown that Donald Rumsfeld said in Myanmar. The known unknown is a huge unknown in Myanmar. So the investors, the foreign investors, yes, they are waiting. They are not stupid. They want to know what the new game is. But actually, there had to be some continuity, of course. You can't break contracts because you change a new government. That's bad for the whole thing, because that is the only way to go. And that is coming back to whether you are prejudicial to certain nations or not. The color of money is green if it is a US dollar. It is not, should not be tied to any country. If you do not do your homework properly, you get duped. That's your job problem. But that is not acceptable in Myanmar at this moment. We have not done our homework in a lot of things, or we have done our homework in a different way, convoluted way, that benefits personally, not the country. So what do you do with those bad legacy projects after the new election, provided a more popular populist government come in? It's dangerous. Uh, it is a government that is uh, continuity it is also, do, the, do we uh, really go back and, and, and analyze them and re, re, renegotiate? No, you can't normally renegotiate contracts once it's done. It is bad for capitalism. Even if it is a very bad contract, it's your fault. I'm sorry to say that. But the thing is, we have a problem. That's a political problem now. So we have bad contracts in the past, or supposedly bad contracts. Nobody really knows. But there's assumption that anything to do with some, some, some uh, groups is bad. Anything to do with some country is bad because of the past. I think that's not the way to run an economy or new, new liberal uh, economic regime, which, as you say, we have adopted. But then you can't tell it to the people on the grassroots who has their hands, their land confiscated, and their jobs disappearing. Whole section of society, perhaps, or certain proportions of elements of society had their jobs structurally 
dissolved when you turn into capitalism? How do you do that? And how do you manage the supply-demand situation, in, especially in perennial crops like rice? Uh, weather is another issue which you don't know. How much, how deep are the pockets of the government to subsidize them for, to tie them over for the next year? Everything is up for grabs. And then there's productionism rising. Labor has now been unshackled, and they are demanding things and trying to make up for the past 50 years, which is a big makeup. And employers are also squeezed. So all are, both sides are right. The employers can't afford to pay more because their margins are so small. The workers are feeling like we are not enough even to, to have a decent meal. So welfare state is another issue which a lot of people might be pushing for, but the country is not rich enough to be a welfare state too. So what are the odds? The odds are, as we say, if you muddle through, but the thing is the international economy is also not in our favor. The way of getting out of poverty by exporting in the old days in the 1780s is no more. What are you going to export? And it's the so-called value added thing, the so-called thing of trying to diversify our big exports have been going on since the 1950s and have not really succeeded even now. So what happens? What about the private sector? How far is the private sector handmaiden of the state and how far is it how far is it going to be really independent? You can never be independent. You are financially dependent on state and policies and so on. The only thing is that the other extreme of the private sector or the tycoons capturing the state. Uh, that is one of the crony problems that people emphasize. I don't think that will happen anyway, in a sense. And even if you capture the state, the state is really still quite weak, so you can't do much. Do you want a strong leader? Do you want a strong state? Yes, some people say, because they are frustrated by the slow progress in economic and political reform. But what prevents the strong leader and the strong state from becoming author too authoritarian? What are the checks and balances? Would the checks and balances turn into more checks than balances between the parliament and the, and, the, and the government? Ruling party, is it true? Is it a ruling party at the moment? If it is a ruling party, why is the parliament at odds with the executive? So because of our very unique constitution, because the party does not rule, right? The executive rules, and the executive is divorced from the, party, the constitution. So the party policies may or may not be carried out by the executive, and they have to wait their turn the next, next five years. Uh, so that is the only democracy, sort of democracy uh, hanging over the executive that, well, if we go against the party next five years, the party may not really like us, blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't seem to work like that. So I think the, the issues are there, but I have no answers for that. And um, there's a lot of opportunities, yes, again, for certain people with certain skills. There are a lot of people who are constantly doomed to be a lowly, lowly low, lower paid employment. How do you lift them up? The, un the education system is supposed to be a mess, but how do you clean up the mess? I don't know. My friend next to, next to me is the, supposed to be the educational advisor. <laughs> you can ask some questions later. <laughs> I have no answers to that. I really have no answers to many, many things. But if as somebody asks, I'm already retired a few months, uh, a month. Would you go back and stay in Burma and die in Burma? Probably yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Dr. Tim Mong, Mong, Mong Tan give us a very strong historical view of Myanmar economic development. And uh, I beg your understanding, you need to look at Myanmar under AEC to really know what's going on, what Myanmar trying to do. Because if you fit in all your description into plan of action that Myanmar is trying to do, you probably will measure the progress much more uh, tangibly. I, I, that one observation I would like to make. And you, you leave a lot of room for, for question as to the future of economic uh, development.